Lecture 18 Memory Encoding Processes We turn our attention now to long-term memory, what James called secondary memory, or memory proper, what people really mean by memory, the permanent repository of knowledge stored in the mind. And the first thing to note is that this knowledge comes in a variety of forms. There are facts that you've learned, such as whether quartz is harder than granite, or when Martin Luther nailed 95 theses to the church door. There's your knowledge of language, like the meanings of words and how to compose grammatical sentences. There are rules, like how to take the square root of a number, or what the best route is from the student union to the psychology building. And then there's your personal experiences, what you had for dinner last Friday night, what happened the last time you behaved irresponsibly, whatever. In answering all these kinds of questions, we have to consult our memories and draw on the knowledge contained in memory. So knowledge is stored in memory, but there are lots of different kinds of knowledge, and that suggests that there might be different kinds of memory even within the category of long-term memory. In fact, in cognitive psychology, we make a fundamental distinction between two types of knowledge stored in memory, declarative knowledge and procedural knowledge. Declarative knowledge consists of factual statements, such as whether quartz is harder than granite, and when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the church door, knowledge of the meanings of words, and knowledge about personal experiences. These are all matters of fact. Procedural knowledge, by contrast, consists of directions for action, rules, and skills, such as how to compose a grammatical sentence, so the rules of grammar are part of procedural knowledge, and are other kinds of rules like mathematical rules about taking square roots of numbers, and behavioral rules such as how to tie a square knot. Declarative knowledge can be further classified into episodic and semantic memory, and procedural knowledge can be further classified into mental and behavioral procedures, and we'll talk about those as the moment arises. First, let's look at that fundamental distinction between declarative and procedural knowledge. Declarative knowledge is factual knowledge concerning the nature of the world in both its physical and its social aspects. It includes knowledge about what words and numbers and other symbols mean, what attributes objects possess, what categories they belong to, it includes our knowledge of events and the contexts in which they take place. It includes all of our autobiographical memory. All declarative knowledge can be represented in what's called propositional format. That is, as sentences having a subject and a verb and an object. So, for example, the word blunt means dull. The number three is less than the number four. A red octagonal sign means you should stop. These are all factual statements about the world, and they're all represented as propositions in declarative memory. And it's sometimes convenient to distinguish between perception-based and meaning-based representations in declarative memory. Perception-based representations often take the form of sensory images and they preserve information about the physical structure of an event or object, what it looks like and what it sounds like. Meaning-based representations often take the form of verbal descriptions, and they preserve information about the meaning and conceptual relations of an object or event. A meaning-based representation of a car is like a dictionary entry. It indicates that the car is a type of motor vehicle, but it doesn't tell you very much about what a car looks like. Procedural knowledge consists of the rules and skills that we use to manipulate and transform declarative knowledge. It includes the rules of mathematical and logical operations, the rules of grammar, inference, and judgment, the strategies that we use for forming percepts and for encoding and retrieving memories, and it includes all sorts of motor skills. All procedural knowledge consists of directions for goal-directed action. 
and any piece of procedural knowledge can be represented in terms of what's known as a production. Productions have a kind of if-then format. They specify a goal and a condition under which some action will achieve a goal. So if you want to drive a standard shift car, then you have to press down on the clutch. If you're pressing down on the clutch, then you put the car in first gear. If the car is in first gear, then you ease up on the clutch while pressing down on the accelerator, and that's how you get the car to move forward. So instead of being represented as single productions, a lot of procedural knowledge is represented as production systems, a whole set of if-then productions. Procedural knowledge comes in two basic forms. In motor procedures, the actions take the form of some kind of overt behavior, overt behavior that alters the publicly observable world, the objective world. The directions for operating a standard shift automobile are like that. Procedural knowledge tells you what to do with the clutch and the gear shift and the gas pedal. And if you do those things, the car moves forward and everybody can see it. In mental procedures, the actions take the form of a mental transformation. They don't alter the publicly observable world, but they do alter the person's private, cognitive, or emotional, or motivational states. Think about the size-distance rule in distance perception. If the retinal image cast by an object is growing, then the object must be coming closer. So you've got an object that takes information, applies a rule, and tells you whether the object is moving toward you or away from you. Or take the rule about square roots. You take a number like 256, find its square root, you determine that it's 16, and that's something that you know that you didn't know before. You've changed your knowledge, it's altered your subjective cognitive state, but it hasn't changed the world outside any. We're not going to talk about procedural knowledge anymore in these lectures, though you will see examples of procedures in the next set of lectures on thinking, reasoning, and problem solving. In these lectures, we're going to focus on declarative knowledge. Within the domain of declarative knowledge, there's a further distinction to be made between two types of declarative knowledge, episodic and semantic memory. Episodic memory is memory for specific events. It includes autobiographical memory, because that's factual knowledge about your own personal experiences, but it can also include factual knowledge about other events as well. The key to episodic memory is that each episode recorded in memory is associated with a unique spatio-temporal context. Every event takes place at a particular time in a particular place. And, as they say, two events can't occupy the same space at the same time. In terms of autobiographical memory, episodic memories also have self-reference. Your autobiographical memory is your knowledge about episodes that have happened to you and things that you've done. Semantic memory, by contrast, is much more abstract. It's a kind of mental dictionary or mental encyclopedia and can, contains a person's context-free knowledge about the world. Semantic memory doesn't make any reference to the episodic context in which it was acquired, and it doesn't really make much reference to the self as an actor or the experiencer of an event either. If I say that happy people smile, or parks have trees, or Saturday follows Friday, or automobiles have wheels, those are all factual statements, and they're therefore pieces of declarative knowledge, but they don't refer to me and they don't refer to any particular event. They're just true. In the rest of these lectures, we're going to focus on episodic memory, our memory for specific events that we've experienced at particular times and in particular places. But we will talk about semantic memory first when we talk about concepts and categories in the, in the lectures on thinking, and later on when we talk about the meanings of words in the lectures on language.
For now, let me just say a couple things about the relations of the among these various forms of memory. First, it appears that most knowledge comes from experience, and therefore most semantic knowledge starts out having a kind of episodic character. When you learn some new fact, you often remember where and when you learned it. However, as similar episodes accumulate, the contextual features of the individual episodic memories are lost, or maybe they blur together, resulting in a fragment of generalized abstract semantic memory. Later in these lectures, I'll also make the point that the formation of an episodic memory depends on the existence of a pre-existing fund of semantic knowledge that allows us to identify and categorize and understand the things that we're experiencing and the things that we're doing. So semantic memories start out as episodic memories and episodic memories draw on semantic memories. Finally, it's important to note that memory itself is a skilled activity. Thus, the encoding and storage and retrieval of declarative memories depends on procedural knowledge, the knowledge that we have about how to put our faculty of memory to use. If you want to remember something well, then you've got to do certain kinds of things. Our knowledge of those things that we do to remember things well, that's part of our procedural memory. So as far as episodic memory is concerned, the question at hand is, how do we remember the things we remember, and why do we forget the things we forget? We can understand the causes of remembering and forgetting in terms of three stages of memory processing, encoding, storage, and retrieval. In encoding, we create a record of some event that leaves a representation of that event in memory. That's known as a memory trace. And the general idea is that all perception leaves some representation of the percept in memory. In storage, some newly encoded memory trace is retained over time in some latent state so that it's available later on for use. And in retrieval, a stored memory trace is recovered so that it can be used in some kind of cognitive task. We encode episodic knowledge in memory. It stays there in storage until it's retrieved and accessed for some kind of use. Remembering some past event obviously depends on success at all three of these stages. You've got to encode a trace of the event in the first place, it's got to stay in storage, and you've got to get it out of storage. But forgetting can involve a failure at any of these stages, either alone or in combination. An event can be forgotten because a trace of that event was never encoded in the first place, or because it was lost from storage, or because a stored trace for some reason can't be retrieved. Sometimes a trace has been encoded, but the way it's been encoded makes it difficult to retrieve. Sometimes the conditions of retrieval can compensate for a poor encoding. We'll see how this all works out in what follows. Unfortunately, when it comes to autobiographical memory, which is what we're really interested in, we don't always have knowledge or control over these three stages. For that reason, laboratory studies of memory usually make use of what's known as the verbal learning paradigm, which initially looks kind of artificial, but turns out to be a very good laboratory model for autobiographical memory in the real world. In the verbal learning paradigm, the subject's task is to memorize one or more lists of familiar words. The fact that the words are already known to the subject makes this an experiment in episodic memory, not semantic memory. It doesn't have to learn the meanings of new words, just has to remember where and when certain words were presented. There are lots of variants on this basic paradigm. The subject might study words or pictures, sentences or paragraphs, slide sequences or film clips. The subject might even be asked to remember odors and tastes and sequences of tones. The precise stimulus materials used don't really matter. The important point is that each list 
and each item on the list comprises a unique event that occurs in a unique spatiotemporal context. Each list, each item on the list, is an episodic memory. If we're particularly interested in studying the processes of encoding a new memory, we would do something to vary the conditions of encoding. One group of subjects might study the list just once, another group might study the list five times. One group might get a slow rate of presentation, another group might get a quick rate of presentation. We might present one group with the list orally and another group with the list visually. In each case we'd be varying the conditions of encoding. Once the list has been presented, then we let some period of time elapse before we test the subject's memory. It might be a long interval or a short interval. The subject might be allowed to rehearse the item silently to himself, or he might be engaged in some kind of difficult cognitive task that would distract him from the list. Remember in the last lecture we defined long-term memory as 30 seconds of distraction. Then after the retention interval we ask the subject to remember what he remembers, what were the items on the list. We could test the subject's recall of the list simply by asking him what were the items on the list or we could employ a recognition test similar to a multiple choice test in which we present the subject with a long list of words some of which were presented others which were not and ask him to tell us which are which. So using the verbal learning paradigm construing the items on the list as specific episodes we can vary the conditions of encoding storage and retrieval to find out why we remember what we remember and why we forget what we forget. Let me give you an idea about how this works. In a moment I'm going to read you a list of familiar words. What I want you to do is to repeat in each one in turn after I read it. After I've read the entire list I'm going to give you a three-digit number and what I want you to do is to subtract seven from that number, take that result, subtract seven from the, that result, then seven again from that result until I tell you to stop. Ready? Here we go. Anger. Bread. Cold. Foot. Girl. King. Mountain. Needle. Rough. Slow. Spider, thief, 763, 756, 749, 742, 735. Keep going till I tell you to stop. Okay, stop. Now write down the words that you remember. Okay. Now write down the names of any animals that you remember. In fact there were some animal names. Was one of the words spider or was it snake? Okay, now check your memory by turning to the next slide. Okay, so there's the list. Twelve items, that's more than the capacity of short-term memory, seven plus or minus two. And I asked you to perform a distractor task known as serial sevens, subtracting seven and a seven and seven again, for a period of thirty seconds. 
So that's a retention interval that makes it long-term memory. There was, in fact, an animal name, and it was spider, not snake. So that's how we use this basic verbal learning paradigm to study memory. Each list that you might be presented with and each word on the list represents a discrete episode of experience, an event that occurred at a particular place in a particular time. We vary the conditions at one or more stages of processing, either encoding or storage or retrieval, and then we observe the effects of these manipulations, these experimental manipulations, on the subject's ability to remember the items on the list correctly in response to one or another kind of query or question. So now with this basic tool in hand, let's look at some of the principles that govern the encoding phase of memory processing. Let's assume that a subject has just perceived an object or an event, that is, studied a list. How does a mental representation of that event get stored in memory? That's the basic question for the encoding phase. And what are the consequences for how an event is encoded for how it'll be remembered later on? Traditionally, the encoding phase of memory processing has been characterized in terms of re rehearsal. Memory has been construed as a product of perception, which it is, it's a byproduct of perception, and the idea is that the more that the item has been rehearsed, the better will be our memory for it later on. In classic associationistic learning theories, like the stimulus response theory of learning, memories are associations that are stamped in the mind by means of repetition. You'll recall from the learning lectures Thorndike's Law of Exercise, which basically says that stimulus response associations are strengthened by use and weakened by disuse. In the very first experimental studies of memory, the German psychologist Hermann von Ebbinghaus formulated this principle of rehearsal in terms of what he called the Law of Repetition, which basically says that retention is a function of the number of times the item has been repeated. Ebbinghaus virtually invented the verbal learning procedure as a paradigm for studying memory, but he didn't use words. He used nonsense syllables, strings of letters, a consonant, a vowel, and a consonant, so he could pronounce it, that he arranged in lists and then asked his subjects to memorize these lists of nonsense syllables in strict serial order. So you might be, you might get a list that says dadj, gex, mub, tev, wall, and then have to repeat that back. Ebbinghaus used nonsense syllables instead of words because he wanted to study what he considered to be pure memory memories that occurred without any pre-existing uh, associations. He was really interested in the principle of association by contiguity, which was the big principle of association back in the 19th century, and he didn't want any extra experimental associations mucking up his experiment. So the idea is that by arranging these nonsense syllables into a list, each nonsense syllable each CVC, consonant, vowel, consonant, would serve as a stimulus for the next one in the list. And each CVC in the list would be a response to the previous one in the list. In one of his experiments, Ebbinghaus varied the number of times he presented the list for study to his subjects. Some lists were studied just once, others were studied several times. Then he'd let a standard retention interval elapse of 24 hours, and then he'd present the list again and ask the subject to memorize it to a criterion of, say, one or two perfect repetitions. Savings in relearning, that is, the amount of time it took the subjects in the various conditions to learn the list after the retention interval, was his measure of memory talked about savings and relearning before, and in fact, Ebbinghaus invented this measure of memory, as well as the nonsense syllable. He was really quite some guy, and I should point out that he served as the subject for his own experiments. So every day he'd sit down and memorize a bunch of lists of nonsense syllables and test his memory for a bunch of lists of nonsense syllables he had memorized on some previous day.
And here's a graph that portrays Ebbinghaus's actual results. Here we have a standard list of 16 nonsense syllables, which Ebbinghaus repeated from 8 to 64 times. And then there are control lists, which he didn't study at all, so that's the lists, those are the lists with zero repetitions. Then, after a retention interval of 24 hours, he measured the time it would take him to learn each list to a criterion of one perfect repetition. Obviously, it took him longer to learn the list if he had never seen it before, but the learning time was systematically related to the number of times that the list had been repeated the day before. With eight repetitions, it took him a long time to learn the list. With 64 repetitions, a lot less. So the more repetitions during the study phase, the encoding phase, the less time was needed to learn the list at the test phase, the retrieval phase. Thus, Ebbinghaus inferred that memory strength increases with rehearsal. Memory strength increases with repetition. That's the law of repetition. Now, Ebbinghaus's findings were consistent with the prevailing theory about associations at the time, but it's now clear that encoding is not merely a function of repetition or rehearsal. Consider a more recent experiment by Craik and Watkins at the University of Toronto. Craik and Watkins presented subjects with a list of familiar words, one at a time, each item presented at a regular interval. And instead of just listening to the list, the subject was given a task which was to detect any word that met a particular criterion. For example, to detect any word that began with the letter P, and to be able to report on demand the most recent word that met that criterion. Whenever a new P word appeared, they could forget the previous one, and they could also forget all the intervening words that did not begin with the letter P. Craik and Watkins also varied the number of non-critical items, that is, items that did not begin with the letter P, between the critical items that did begin with the letter P. Thus, in effect, they varied the amount of rehearsal devoted to each target. After going through the entire list, then the subjects were surprised with a recall test in which they were asked to remember all the critical words on the list, in this case, all the words that began with the letter P. Here's a concrete example to make the Craik and Watkins procedure clearer. I've got a list of words. Some of the words begin with the critical letter P. So the first word on the list is P's. It begins with P and the subject has to remember that. Next word is chair. It can ignore that. Next word is potato. The subject for, can now get rid of the word P's, can forget the word P's, and has to remember the word potato. Book, egg, cat, window, punt, new word beginning with P, forget potato, remember punt, radio, music, spiral, position, forget punt, pick up position, bell, parking, forget position, pick up parking. So peas gets rehearsed for one item's worth, potato for four items worth, punt three items worth, position one item's worth, and parking, well, no rehearsal at all. Let's see what the effect of varying the amount of rehearsal is on memory for these critical words. In a word, nothing. This figure plots the percentage of subjects recalling an item as a function of the number of repetitions received by each item during the study phase, the encoding phase of the experiment. By the way, recall for the non-critical items was very poor, which is not surprising. No rehearsal, no memory. However, the recall of the critical targets was also relatively poor, even though each critical word had received some rehearsal. Most important, there was no correlation at all between recall and the amount of rehearsal each item had received. If an item received just one repetition, it was recalled about 16% of the time. If an item received 12 repetitions, it was recalled about 19% of the time. Not a big difference. Overall, there was just no relationship between repetition and memory. Based on results like these, Craik and Watkins argued that there are actually two different kinds of rehearsal. 
there's a big difference between maintenance rehearsal or rote repetition and what they called elaborative rehearsal. Maintenance rehearsal simply maintains traces in an active state in something like short-term memory or working memory, whereas elaborative rehearsal links new items to pre-existing knowledge stored in memory and is really what's important in laying down a lasting trace in long-term memory. Road rehearsal may be fine for remembering a telephone number when you're trying to get from the phone book to the telephone, but in their view, memories are only permanently stored if they're subject to some degree of elaboration. Let me give you a personal example. I used to teach at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and I worked with a travel agency known as Gulliver's Travels, which still exists in Madison. And when I hooked up with my travel agent, he said to me, well, you'll always remember my telephone number. It's 256-4444. 256 is 4 raised to the fourth power, 4 to the power of 4, which of course it is. Doug, his name was Doug, linked his telephone number to something that I knew out of my knowledge of mathematics. I haven't lived in Madison in more than 20 years, and I haven't seen or talked to Doug in more than 20 years, but I still remember that telephone number. That's what elaborative rehearsal can get you. The importance of elaborative rehearsal is illustrated by experiments performed by Craik and his colleagues on what is known as the depth of processing paradigm in the study of memory. In depth of processing experiments, subjects are presented with a list of words, one at a time, and they're asked to perform one of four kinds of orienting tasks. In a structural or orthographic task, they're asked to make some judgment about the physical characteristics of the printed word. For example, whether it's printed in upper or lower case, or whether it's printed in a particular color, or whether it contains a particular letter, or to count the number of vertical lines or horizontal lines that are in the word. Some task that focuses the subject's attention on what the word looks like. In a phonemic or acoustic ta task, they're asked to make some judgment about what the word sounds like. For example, whether the word rhymes with some other word. In a semantic task, they're asked to make a judgment about the meaning of the word, whether it meant something similar to some other word, or whether uh, it belonged in the same category, or was somehow associated semantically with some other word. And in a sentence task, they were asked to judge whether the word made sense in a particular, in a particular sentence, a judgment that is based on linguistic syntax, knowledge of grammar, as well as knowledge of semantics or meaning. So subjects were presented with a number of words. For some words, they made a structural judgment. For other words, they made a phonemic judgment. For other words, they might make a category judgment. And for other words, they might make a sentence judgment. The exact tasks vary, but you get the idea. Note that in this experiment, the subjects aren't actually asked to memorize anything. They're simply asked to make some judgments about the words and each of the words is presented just once. There's just one study trial, one encounter with the word. Nevertheless, at the end of the experiment, the subjects were surprised with tests of recall or recognition for the words that they had made judgments about. The typical finding of the experiment is that memory is very poor for words that are subject to orthographic or phonemic judgments compared to semantic or sentence judgments. If subjects make a judgment about the appearance of the word, what it looks like or what it sounds like, memory's relatively poor. But if subjects make a judgment about the meaning of the word, that is, what category it belongs to or how it fits in a particular sentence, memory is very good indeed. This effect became known as the depth of processing effect. In Craig's interpretation, each of these orienting tasks required a different kind of processing at the, type of, at the time of encoding. The orthographic and phonemic tasks required only shallow processing, not much processing at all, while the semantic and sentence tasks required deeper processing. And the idea here is that the deeper the processing, the better the memory. Studies like this illustrate what we now think of as the elaboration principle in memory. Memory for an event 
is a function of the extent to which that event is analyzed and related to pre-existing knowledge at the time of encoding. We can define elaboration in a number of ways. First, simply in terms of the sheer amount of attention that's paid to the event, or the number of attributes or features of the event that are processed at the time of perception, or the number of links formed between the event and other pre-existing pieces of knowledge. The more attention we pay, the deeper we process the event, the more we elaborate the event with, re with respect to things that we already know, the better the memory. So now we understand that there are at least two different modes of processing at the time of encoding, two ways in which we can encode a trace in memory. Rote maintenance rehearsal, in which we mentally repeat an event over and over again without adding to it, maintains an item in immediate memory, short-term memory, working memory, but does not create a particularly long-lasting trace. Creating a long-lasting memory trace requires that we add something to the trace at the time of encoding. And this process of adding something to the trace is what goes on in elaborative rehearsal. Elaborative rehearsal adds something to the trace by connecting the new event, this new memory, up to things that we already know. This added value is critical to creating a long-lasting memory trace. It turns out that elaborative processing is absolutely critical to memory encoding. But elaboration isn't the only process that's important for encoding. The elaboration principle applies to individual list items and what it basically says is that retention is improved if we connect individual list items to previous knowledge, to something we already know. But retention is also improved if we connect individual list items to each other, if we establish links between individual list items. Evidence for this idea comes from studies of organizational activity in memory, in which we compare the order in which subjects remember words to the order in which those words were originally presented to them. And when we do that, what we usually find is that subjects reorganize the list. They reorder the items. They group them together in various ways. So, for example, if we asked subjects to study this list, then gave them a distraction interval, and asked them to remember the items in the list, they probably wouldn't remember the items in the order in which they were presented. Rather, they'd probably remember the body parts together, foot and finger and mouth, and the animals, lion, elephant, rat, the articles of clothing, blouse, coat, and tie, and the colors, orange, amber, and purple. They're reorganizing the list to put items that belong to the same category of things together. This is a phenomenon known as category clustering, grouping together items according to shared category membership. Here's a classic study by Bousfield and Cohen that shows how category clustering is related to recall. In this study, the subjects were given several different recall trials. They studied the list, recalled it, studied the list again, recalled it again, studied the list again, and recalled it again. Obviously, memory improved over trials, but what's important is that the degree of category clustering also increased over these repeated study test cycles. The more subjects clustered their items together by category membership, the better they were able to remember the items. Organization in recall doesn't have to be based on category membership. If subjects study a list like this, especially over repeated study test cycles, they'll tend to recall together those items that are associatively related. Boy, girl, black, white, table, chair, long, short, eagle, bird, flowers, blossom. Here, the organization of the list isn't based exactly on category membership, but rather based on pre-existing word associations that people have.
if I give you the word boy and ask you to give me the first word that comes to mind, you'll almost certainly say girl. If I say table, you'll almost certainly say chair. Reorganizing lists in this way helps us to remember the items in the list. Category clustering and associative clustering are forms of organization that capitalize on organization that's built into the list by the experimenter. But subjects can show organizational activity that helps recall even when there are no categorical or associative relationships built into the list at all. This was discovered by Tolving in the phenomenon of subjective organization. In a list like this, iron, table, dog, pepper, blue, window, boy, stars, no two items belong to the same conceptual category, so there's no basis for category clustering, and no two items are associatively related, so there's no basis for associative clustering. Yet, over multiple study test trials, subjects, individual subjects, will organize this material, reorganize it, so that they can recall the items effectively, but each subject will organize the items in a somewhat different way. Often, this organization takes the form of a story or an image. So, for example, you might have an image of a boy sitting at a table with a dog at his feet. There's a pepper on the table. He's looking out a window through iron bars at the stars in the blue night sky. Somebody else might conjure up some other image. It doesn't really matter what the image is or what the story is so long as it links all the items together. To the extent that you can do this, impose some subjective organization on the material, you'll remember it better. So the phenomena of category clustering, associative clustering, and subjective organization illustrate the organizational principle in memory, which is that memory for an event is a function of the extent to which that event is related to other events at the time of encoding. If you've got a bunch of things to remember, you'll remember them better if you try to link each of them to at least some of the others. The organization principle may seem like just a special case of the elaboration principle, but they're really somewhat different. They're really very different. The elaboration principle refers to single item processing or item-specific processing in which individual list items are related to pre-existing knowledge. But organization refers to relational or inter-item processing by which individual list items are related to each other. Both elaboration and organization reflect cognitive activity on the part of the subject, what the British psychologist F. C. Bartlett, Frederick C. Bartlett called effort after meaning. The more effort, the better the memory. The more meaning, the better the memory. Even with Ebbinghaus's nonsense syllables, which are intentionally stripped of all meaning, subjects try to give the nonsense syllables meaning, try to relate them to words that they already know. The extent to which subjects do that, they remember nonsense syllables better than if they don't. In both elaboration and organization, we're trying to make sense of the item, relate it to what we already know. In elaboration, we relate individual new items to what we already know. In organization, we relate a number of new items to each other. So now we have three ways to process an item at the time of encoding. First, rote or maintenance rehearsal which maintains individual items in a highly active state, makes them highly accessible in short-term or working memory, but doesn't have much effect on their status in long-term memory. Elaboration, which connects individual items to pieces of pre-existing knowledge, and organization, which connects individual items to each other. Elaboration and organization are critical to long-term memory. The more elaboration, the more organization at the time of encoding, the better the memory at the time of retrieval.